manage forage to minimize supplemental needs. Supplements expensive. You'd rather have them harvest it than somebody out west harvest it, put it in the bag, and send it to you, right? Well, they're gonna make money on it somewhere. Yeah, they gotta make money on it. Cut, cut that middle man out. Yeah. <laughs> And we want to maximize forage utilized by the cow. Uh, like Deanna said, energy, carbohydrates, we'll just go ahead and call it TDN from now on. So if you hear TDN, think energy, calories. And protein, we're going to call it CP or crude protein. So the biggest thing that affects the quality of your forage is the nutritive value and the amount you have out there. If you have a large amount of low quality forage, she's still gonna go downhill. If you have a high amount, or if you have a high quality forage, and you don't have much of it, she's still gonna go downhill. You have to, there's a balancing act. You're not gonna have the best, but you're gonna have a lot of a pretty good forage. That's what you're looking for. And in Florida, it's hard to do, but you can do it. So here's pretty much the four main forages we, we work with. The hay grass, star grass, limpo grass or hermothria, and jigs, Bermuda grass. Now these are all nutritive values of each of these grass after a six week regrowth in July. So that meant they mowed it middle of May and they come back in July and they took samples and tested it. So you can see the hay grass Digestibility is on the lower end of these. Now, how much do these numbers mean in reality? If you went out and took this sample, is that going to stay that way? Say you went out and put your bay grass in, you got a sample, and you had 15% crude protein and 56% energy. Next month is going to be different. The following month is going to be different. I would have thought the limpo grass would have been better than digestibility than the star grass, so. You would think. You I mean, would think. What our discussion last time, mm -hmm. you know, about the difference in the stems and the leaves and all that it produces. Well, there's a lot that it depends on. Uh, I guess you're right. It depends on, you know, if it was fertilized, if it wasn't fertilized. If it was fertilized, you're going to have more growth, faster growth. So it's going to be tender yeah, and it'll be more digestible. Point. So there's a lot of things that go in to looking at forage values and determining what your cow needs. The bad you're thing- you just don't pick out a number and choose that one. Right, okay. you're right. That's what I'm, I was about to say. The bad thing for y'all is I'm an economist, and one of the, our favorite sayings is hold all else equal. And that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna hold this bahia grass sample equal, and we're gonna look at how that bahia grass interacts with your cow. Matt Hersom at UF has a great chart and I didn't, I didn't print it off because it's really long. Uh, if y'all want it, give me your email address and I'll email it to you. But to eat this document, in the back of that, he's got the nutritional requirements for any, any uh, weight cow, how, you know, 10, 20, 30 pounds milk, however many months after calving. So what I did was I picked out one that I wanted to use. And I picked out a 1,200 pound cow, 20 pounds of milk per day, what she's producing, and she just calved three months ago. So that's probably the hardest time on that cow, is three months after she calved. That calf's dragging her down. And this is her requirements. She needs 28 and a half pounds of dry matter per day. And what that means is, if you look at forages, the hair grass usually runs about 25% dry matter. So when you grab a bunch of bahia grass in your hand, 25% of that's dry matter. So she needs, and that term comes out to be a lot, almost 30 pounds. It's a lot of eating. It's a lot of eating. <laughs> it it's is. a lot of eating. The, the TDN of that grass, the energy in that grass needs to be 57.6%, and the crude protein needs to be about 10%. So what that breaks down to is every day, she's got to get almost 16 and a half pounds of energy and 2.8 pounds of crude protein. That's for maintenance. That's, she's not going to gain, she's not going to lose. If you wanted to gain, she's going to get more than that. But we're just talking about maintenance. But if you want her to breathe back, she better be getting more than that. We'll get to that. Okay. okay. <laughs> I'm just trying to make sure we're making money here. Right. <laughs> Sorry. No, you're good, you're good. 
So if we have 28.4 pounds of this bag of grass right here, this is what we have. We have 15.99, might as well say 16 pounds of energy and 4.23 pounds of crude protein. So she's off about 2.5%. Well, what does 2.5% today mean? 2.5% tomorrow, 2.5% the next day. You're looking at two weeks, well, she's going to start losing weight. That little bit will make her lose weight. And while she's nursing, if she's losing weight by the time weaning comes, she, you got to pump her up before you pull the bulls out with her. Or, I mean, before you put the bulls out, they're not winning, excuse me. Are you already starting to see this grass change with the cool weather we're seeing come in? It's nasty mm -hmm. back a little bit, so you, that's even getting worse right It's now. getting worse, yeah. As yeah. it goes, so in the wintertime, you've got to change this thing. Barney, I keep telling you, but I'm going to get to it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get it patient, I'm sorry. I know, I know. You know. <laughs> I'll shut up. I'm not being rude. I know, I'm not either. I'm just, I'm just thinking about the same way it works. I mean, you know, so. Yeah. Now, the other way to look at this, is that is the bare minimum what she needs. She has to have that 28.5 or 28.5 pounds of dry matter per day. If she's able to get 30 pounds, now the rumen depends on what size cow or depends on the cow. She can get more than 2 percent or 2.2 percent at day is what they say. So she could probably eat up to 30 pounds. Well, now look at her. That pound and a half extra of dry matter got her over the limit. Now, she's probably not going to gain a whole lot. She's going to gain a little bit. I mean, you're not going to know, but she's pretty much in maintenance mode. She's getting all the protein she'll ever need, almost double, and she's right on the mark with energy. So just having that extra pound and a half of dry matter, four, kept her from losing weight and kept her the same weight. So that's kind of, that's the important part of looking at your forage. It's not what's in it. Well, it is. Part of it is. But it's how much she has available to her. The other part of it, now we're going to kind of switch gears. The same cow, now we're six months later. She's still putting out, we're just going to assume we don't wean. She's still putting out. I was about to say, it's pretty close to being. I told you. <laughs> we're going to assume a lot. I'm a communist. We assume a lot. Okay. We're going to assume that she's not weaning that. Nine-month cow still dragging on her, but now her requirements have changed. We've gone down from 28 and a half to 24. TDN's way down, 47. So the same behind grass will sustain it, even with the less TDN. But this is the part that's bad. That's the part you got to worry about. Is that one third pound of energy that she's not getting? every day after that in that third month. But what this shows you is not only does nutritive value, how much forage you have, but what life what part of the life stage she's in. Is she trying to get back right to breed? Is she just calved has she just calved? Does she have a three month calf dragging her down? So it's not just I went and did a forward sample and that bag grass looks pretty good. And there's a lot more to it than that. So here's a test question. What happens to forage as the yield goes up, quality goes down? During these early stages, this early vegetative, mid-vegetative, quality's pretty good. As we get up to boot and mature, it drops off hard. So what we have to do with our forages, and that's why rotational grazing is such a great practice to do, is because you're able to do it. Like Joe Benjamini said last week, if you're gonna if you're gonna rotate, you need to rotate it where you go where she goes down to three inches. So you have to whisper in her ear and say, "Hey, only graze down to three inches." <laughs> no, you got to pull her off when it gets down that low. Because what we're trying to do is keep that grass from getting mature, staying mid vegetative somewhere. Now, if everybody knows if you continue when you got continuous grazing, they mow down spots and they leave some spots they never touch it. What happens comes the winter time. They start eating those spots they never touched because there's grass left there. Well, that is probably the worst forage in that field. First of all, it wasn't good enough when it was growing, and now it's been sitting out there for months. So it's, it's almost like she's getting nothing from it. So when you rotate, you're leaving, you're leaving, a, good, you're leaving a good mid vegetative state grass where you should be, 
for them to come back home. Here's a good example of, I like grass by the way. Early veg, mid veg, root, antithesis. Fiber digestibility, just think TDN, think energy. In the early, it's high. This is Bahia grass, 75%. That's really high. But as we get down, we're going to be grazing somewhere around in here because the early vegetative and even in mid vegetative, until we get to this mid line right here, the hay grass doesn't produce enough for them to get what they need. It has to have enough, you have to have enough grass and the nutritive value that they need. Once we get out here to mature, what? They're only getting about a third out of it. So they're eating the pound and they're getting 33% of it's actually digestible. So they're hardly getting anything out of that. Now this is what bahia grass looks like available forage throughout the year in your pasture if you just got a solid bahia grass pasture. Like Marty said, we're right about here. Look what happens as the next great. coming months. This line here, and we look over here, I'll explain it, this is pounds per acre. So you're looking at 3,000 all the way up to 6,000 pounds per acre. So we're somewhere around here. We're about to bottom out, because if this graph continued, it'd come down right there to December. So like I was talking about, in the summertime, we have pretty good forage, but we have a lot of it too. So you really don't have to worry about them going backwards. It's right here. And if you look at these lines, these are two different requirements according to two different studies. This is Marsh and this is NRC of what she needs. So it depends on who you believe. You believe NRC, she's not getting it from December to April. If you're her. She's getting it, but it's barely getting it. In March, she's not getting it. So these months right here are the ones that we really earn our key. But I'll state my nose in here. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, a lot of problem you have is people don't start supplementing until they have a frost. Right. Well, that grass is already, the weather like it is before you get a frost, it's already way down there. You need to supplement earlier than the frost. It's, yeah, it's already way down If you wait, you, you're already past your point. Yeah. And really, you can stockpile. I know I just said mature grass is not good. But if you stockpile, not just the hay, and we'll, we'll get into that too. Uh, but you supplement them with, with uh, like you said, if you start with grass, you have to eat old grass, supplement them with a little molasses, they, yeah. they can get it and still get their protein. Well, they're going to get their energy too. That molasses is going to get their energy. Right. That old grass will have right. some protein in it. Yeah, it's just energy, energy yeah. is what it, what, it, what it doesn't have. So, from December to about April or May, this is usually what we have. Now, if you look at this picture, I know, I know we've seen places like this. It's a golf course where the calf that should have been weaned, nursing the cow, is about to fall over. What do you think her chances are getting bred back right now, looking at this picture? Four. It's pretty low. It's pretty low. Now, I got some that do that every year. They live like they have warmed over and they have the best looking calf. How old are they? And I'll be damned if they don't breed back every year. How old are they? Four or five. Four or five. I, always I, I just thought it's the worst looking cow I've ever seen, but I can't get rid of it because the calf is dang good. I always <laughs> you know, so, I mean, you have some like that that just look that way, you know, and they produce good calves every well, year. Sometimes and they, they bounce back. Sometimes you're just going to have that cow. You know, I always, I, my theory is this is they're putting everything they can into that calf. Mm -hmm. So they're a good mother by doing that. You just need to help them a little bit on something. Right. That's what we That's what we look at. Well, they don't take good pictures. You look no, at this thing. No. <laughs> they're ugly, you know. <clears throat> and I, I always I always tell that joke when someone says, you know, well, I got that 12-year-old that gives me a calf every year. I said, yeah, you got that one. And how many did you go through to get that one? Yeah. There was a lot that was cold to get that one. Yeah. But like you said, there, you can have them. You can have them. You'll have the ones that are just made to breed. But Unbelievable. Yeah, you got to find them. If you find them, hold on to them. So this kind of shows, what I'm going to show here is an example of Having a good nutritive value, but not having enough, enough forage. This is the hay grass, crude protein through the month, starting in January, going to December. Here's your high that they observe, the low. So the medium or the median average is somewhere around in there, around 10%. About what you expect from the hay grass. Even in the winter time, we see it pump up a little bit. 
But the bad thing is, we got to remember this graph. Yeah, it's got 10% protein, but you don't have anything out there. So what you do have is got good protein. You might have 12% protein, but there's just there's not enough for it. You don't have enough volume. Right. There's not enough. There's not enough tonnage yeah. out there for. It. So what happens? This is Bahia grass crude protein. And this is in pounds. This is pounds that she's eating. So this is counting the nutrient value and the amount that's out there. So it doesn't matter if it's 10%. So right here, if we look at 1.1%, it doesn't matter if it's 10 or 15, she's still getting 1.1 pounds, excuse me, I said percent. But she's still getting 1.1 pounds. Well, we got a cabin in November. We're putting the, putting the bulls out on her in February. We're weaning her, or we're weaning in July and August. What's going on right here? This is what Bahia grass, the protein Bahia grass has, and this is her requirement. That big circle is a deficit. And that is the worst time to not give her that nutrition because she's calving and you're trying to get her back into shape to rebreed. And it doesn't matter if it's protein, TDN, it looks the same way. Or energy, it looks the same way. Bahia grass energy drops because there's not much of it out there. She's calving. You're trying to get her back up to rebreed, and there's not enough energy in that pasture. So you get, you've got to supplement her, or you got to do something else. How about you change your calving time? You can change your calving time. I did mine. Yeah. They and this better. is, and, and Barty's got a great point. This is for somebody who's in the truckload again and trying to get a good price. That's why they're full calving. You can change your calving time. You know, and what everybody worries about is if you move this cabin over here to where she's doing good, you're looking at May, June, July, August, it might be a little bit rougher on those calves to be in that hot weather. If she's acclimated to the South Florida, the calves will probably be all right. I'll move mine to the other end. You move towards the other end? I, 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 by the 15th September they start, mm -hmm. and by 15th October I got three quarters of my ground. Okay, so you kind so of I, then I backed it up a little backed bit. Backed up a little bit that way. Yeah. And I don't have to worry about the calf sucking through the heat in the summer. That's a good idea. Yeah, that's a good you know, point. It kind of goes through. This. And now, if it got cold weather, you got another. A few years ago, we had freezing weather. We lost some calves, had some issues. Mm -hmm. They were small, you know. So pick the one you want to deal with. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's not a good it's not a good combination. But that's that's pretty much why we have, for the most part, the larger operation fall calving to get that better price in the summer. Yep. And, uh, and they don't have to have calves. <clears throat> so why do we care about her putting on weight from calving to breeding? Why does that matter? we got to get her bred. She's not going to breed if she's in poor condition. Now, this is from a study back in 93, but they, they did body condition score pregnancy testing. So when they came through the shoot, they gave them a body condition score. And I want you all to pull out that body condition score, God. And I'm going to explain that a little bit. This has a backside to it that goes from 6, 7, 8, 9. We're not even worried about that. We don't care. We don't care about body condition score 6, 7, 8, or 9. All we're worried about is this front side, 1, 2, 3, 4. If she's 5 and over. We're happy. If she's a nine, uh, if she's an eight or nine, you're not doing something right. You're giving her way too much supplement. You're she may not breed either. No, she may not breed. That's the issue we find. But she's a pet. Yeah. <laughs> she, she's one of them boss cows that gets in there and gets all the feed. Right. <laughs> so what we're looking at here, when they ran those cows to the chute, The ones that were body condition score three or less, only 31% of them were bred. As we moved up to four, that number went to 60% of them were bred. And as we got to five, almost 90% of them were bred. Now the difference between body condition scores two or three, four, or five is about 75 pounds. So if we go back, think about that, 75 pounds, She's a three when she calves. 
What do you got? Four months to put 150 pounds on her? That's not going to do it. If she's a four, that's not going to do it. You're still going to have to supplement. So it's still a good idea to start thinking about supplementing during those times. Even if you have, even if you have available forage, that supplement is going to keep her in this good body condition score range. Now, here's a test question. Body condition score five is off. That's what we're looking for. If we can get a six, that's great. But when I go out looking at cows and doing body condition score, I look at it and I say, is she a five or less? Is she a five or above? I don't care if she's a two or a three. I just look and see if she's five and less, she needs to put on weight. If she's five and up, she's good. So body condition score five is where you want them to be at. That's their optimal body condition score. Six, seven, yeah, that'd be great. Probably not going to happen. Eight, nine, no way it's going to happen. If you're getting them up to that, you maybe spend too much on feed. That's what I'm, that's what I'm, she's a pet. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're not doing the books right. No. You won't be able to keep her very long. Right. <laughs> now here's another test question. Here is calving interval. Calving interval is the amount of days from when she calves until she calves again. Now if we look, body condition score two, the ones that did breed, now remember that, the ones that did breed, well, well let's even go to three, that was 30%, it's 409 days until she calved again, from when she calved the first time until she calved again. So that's what, a year and two months? That's a long time. Too long. It's too long. Getting there from a three to four, you cut that down by what? Uh, 40 days, a month and a week. And getting there to body condition score five. What is that? Almost uh, just, just 50 over, days. Just over a year. Yeah. That's almost two months. So she's going to give you a calf every year. She's going to give you a calf every year in a couple months, and that's going to turn into longer and longer. So as body condition score increases, calving interval decreases. The amount of time between calves decreases. Not much so after you get past the five. No, like once you get past the five, it's pretty much, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's what I'm saying. All we're worried about is body condition score five. If she's a five, she's good. If she's over a five, she's good. We're just worried about five and below, getting her back up to a five. So what can you do? In the warm season, there's a, you have a lot more options than you do in the cool season. How many of y'all ever play in astronomy, have it on your place? Well, astronomy is a warm season lagoon. It's not from South Florida, but it's well adapted to South Florida. Uh, the pH range is right, about five and a half to six. And it can tolerate wet soils. That's the biggest thing about astronomy. It can tolerate staying in water for a little while. Most commonly, you're going to overseed this on your bahia grass. Now, if you get into the EQIP, the NRCS program, they will cost share 75% to plant this if you get in the program. Uh, I really like astronomy. It grows really well here. I have even see people bale it up and put it as hay. Now, saying that, the hay, it gets pretty stemmy by the time it gets that big. Once it gets, once it gets mature, and once it goes dormant, the leaves shrivel up, and there's not many leaves left. There's a lot of stems. But now what the cows will do is during the wintertime, they'll usually leave it alone in the beginning of the winter. But as the wintertime keeps going, they'll go back and get those stems because those stems are better than the behavior grass that's, out, that's underneath them. For the most part, crude protein in the leaves averages about 20%, the stems about 10%. So even the stems are pretty good in protein, even after they sit out there. Uh, the TDN, now this is not after it's gone dormant. This is about the time you're going to graze it, about November, 60 to 70%. But still, by November, we're in that downhill bahia from October. So getting that extra energy in her, especially if she's calving, that's going to do a lot for that deficient, that, that big circle that we had. Um, you want to plant it in June when the rains start. Plant should be grazed 18 inches, pull the cows off 8 to 10, maybe even up to 14. 
Now the biggest thing about astronomy is if you want the plants to reseed, because this is an annual, you have to let it reseed if you want it to come back. You need to pull the cows off about mid-August. So you plant it in June, it gets up 18 inches, you might graze it once, twice if you're lucky. Pull the cows off in June and wait till November so that seed gets hard. It's a seed pod, have you ever seen like beggar weed, you know, it sticks to your pant leg. It looks almost like that. Once it gets hard, you can send the cows back out in it and they can graze it. And if you rotate, they'll spread that astronomy around through the manure. But you want to wait till that seed gets hard so you get more astronomy next year. How, uh, how much is protected by herbicide in your bed grass? You can't spray it. That's another downfall. Yeah, that's what. Just about every spray, 2,4-D, weed master grazing that is faster you. guard, it's going to get it. So, if you and want to... have a year like we've had where the water's thin the grass out and you got weeds coming through, you could have a problem. You could have a problem, yeah. Now, I mean, what you can do is you can wait. You can wait until it seeds out. Early spring, you can get those weeds before the astronomy kind of takes off. And you might set it back but you can still treat the weeds. That's the bad thing about all these legumes. I know. Is if you're spraying, you're not going to have them. Um, or before you plant, you can come through with a good spraying program, knock back as much of the weeds as you can, plant astronomy, because this stuff grows tall and thick and it'll shade out a lot of weeds. Um, next one here is Atlas Clover. It's a warm season legume, just like astronomy. It's adapted to South Florida, five and a half, six pH. It has to have well-drained soils. It does not tolerate wet soils. If you have standing water for two or three days, do not have Alice Clover planted. It'll yellow and melt. It cannot stand to sit in water for two or three days. So if you have a sand ridge or something you want to plant Alice Clover, yeah, go for it. Um, easiest way to plant it, Overseed it by hay in May to June. It's pretty easy to plant this chop, broadcast, and come back with a drag. It's a pretty high quality forage, too. Crisp protein gets up to 18%, TDN about 70%. Once it's established, it can tolerate heavy grazing and mowing. So if you have a high dry place that does good in Bahia, not that many weeds, you can plant house clover and hay it, and you'll get a pretty high quality hay out of this. That's probably one of the instances I would say plant house clover. Remember, it's got to be high and dry. Um, wet conditions during the summer can severely limit the growth or kill the sand. So once it does get, once it does sit and stand in water for a day or two, it's going to it's going to knock it back, and you're not going to get near as much tonnage as you would if it hadn't sat in water. Or if it sits in water too long, it's going to kill it. Carcone desmonium, it's a perennial warm season legume. Pretty well adapted in South Florida, five and a half to six pH, and it's commonly overseeded in Bahia grass. Um, the good thing about carcone desmonium, it's not as high quality as astronomy or Alice clover. It can get up to 20% crude protein, but the energy usually stays pretty low since it's pretty stemmy. I mean, it's kind of like a bush. It can't stand wet feet when you plant it, but after that, it becomes tolerant to drought and wet conditions. So, the big advantage of having a carbon desmonium is it sticks around, it's persistent. So, if you ever get a good stand of it, you're probably going to keep it. Unless you come over a grazing mix, then you're not going to keep it. Or 2,4-D or anything. Uh, the, only, the only kind of downfall is it is susceptible to root, that's a typo, root not nematode uh, during seedling. But once once it's established, the nematodes usually leave it alone, it can tolerate wet and drought. So what to do in the cool season? Well, ryegrass. That's once you get south to 60, there's not many options in the cool season. Ryegrass is one of them. It tolerates poorly drained soil, so it likes to be a little wet. It can, I've seen it grow in pH of four and a half. 
So, I mean, even if you got acid soils, low pH soils, it'll, it'll grow in that. The biggest thing about ryegrass is when you plant it, the rains quit. So, your planting dates are October 15th to 1st of December. And that is probably the biggest downfall about planting ryegrass is you can't ever tell if it's going to rain on it after you plant it. If it doesn't rain on it, you're not going to have ryegrass. It likes cool, wet weather. Yeah, it likes cool, wet weather. But now, I will say, most folks have a place they can grow ryegrass next to a flag pond, something that is wet during the summer, it dries up in the winter, it still stays muddy. That's where you can grow some ryegrass. It may not be a big area. If you have a hermothria field, it might be the place to mow it down or when you're cutting hay or grazing, graze it down low and come in and plant ryegrass underneath it. I just do not depend on the rain to irrigate your ryegrass. Uh, the one, one of the disadvantages is crown rust is pretty common. It's a fungus that gets on the leaves, turns into bronze color. The good thing about that, grazing will get rid of it. As long as you keep it grazed down, you probably won't get crown rust. If you do get crown rust, turn the cows out on it. They'll eat it back and they'll pretty much take care of it. And it won't hurt the cows. Here's this is from Mississippi State. This is their uh, nutritional values on ryegrass. Vegetative height when you're grazing it, crude protein of 15, the TDN of 60. So it's a good grass. It's high quality grass. It's most of the time a lot better than your astronomy during the winter months. Uh, once it gets mature, it pretty much falls off. So you have to kind of stay on it. You can't, you can't let them continuously graze it, and you can't pull them off for too long. You have to rotate them in and out. Hay, I don't think you're going to cut dry grass hay down here. You'll melt on you. Yeah, you're just not going to do it. I wouldn't even worry about hay. This is the one I'd worry about, grazing the vegetation. And that, if you can get a good sand of ryegrass, it's going to come in strong in January and February, and that is the worst time for bahia. So if you can give them a shot of that 60% TDN or somewhere around there, it's going to do them a lot of good. The downside, you hit it right on the head, you got to rotate them off and on. you got to rotate them off for and on. For the grass and for the cow. Right. you got to have a place to be able to do that, and you got to feel you can shut them off from them. Right. Yeah, so that's, that's the thing, yeah. That's the labor part of yeah. the land. Because if, if you don't rotate them, the cows know what good grass is. Like, y'all know what good food is. I went back and got a second thing of the potatoes because I knew they were good. <laughs> they'll do the same thing. They'll leave that old tough of hay alone, and they'll just mow that ryegrass down until it's about dead. And then they might look at the hay. I put this in here because I've seen it do well next to your place at Buck Island. Gene, is, he's got a good stand of white clover. He planted it three years ago. I can't get it to book the squad. It's right across the canal. Oh, yeah. I tried it, tried it. It's got to be wet. It's got to be wet. But uh, it's a cool season lagoon. Anywhere else in Florida besides, or anywhere else in the United States, it comes back every year. South Florida mostly acts like an annual where you got to plant it every year. Um, unless you're lucky. Fertile soils and flat wood sites are needed to plant this. you got to have moisture. you got to have moisture through Oct from October through May. So those wet spots, Thinking about planting ryegrass, you might want to plant a ryegrass white clover mixture. Uh, planting dates run about the same as ryegrass, November 1st, November 15th. You can you can push it on out in December. It depends on what the weather is going to do. Uh, bad thing about this year, last year would have been a good time to plant a lot of these cool season forages if you could have, if you could have got them in the ground early and up before we got the nine inches of rain in January. This year, it's going to be tougher because they're expecting it to be drier than normal. So what's drier than normal in South Florida in January? No. So they're getting a half inch, we're getting nothing. But it should shut off completely. Yeah. So you have to have it in those wet spots that you can either irrigate or next to some wetland that they're going to, they're going to draw some of that water in from that. Now, white clover, like a falfa, it's, it's a really high quality winter forage if you can get it to grow well. Uh, crude protein can get up to 15%, but really TDN can exceed 70%. Root knot nematode does affect white clover. It depends on what variety you get. Uh, the traditional one, 
Osceola, created by UF, is popular, but the newer one, Oconee, or Coney, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, it's resistant to root knot nematode. Now here's a test question. And I've heard this from several folks. Back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, used to be a lot of white clover before. Well, what happened? Snowbirds. Snowbirds. Well, what happened to what happened to Sin what happened to Orlando in 1940? They built they built Disneyland. Mickey came to town, and they they dredged out the Semi River. They dredged out close to Ashy and St. Louis and St. Lucie. Made a lot more drainage, a lot that. less moisture in the wintertime. Yeah, the rain would quit, but you still have this flow from all the Kissimmee Channel lakes down to Lake Okeechobee out through the Everglades. So you still had moisture just because you didn't have rain. And that made it really good for white clover to grow. But now we've started to drain it and we get drought conditions during the wintertime. So the combination of nematodes and viruses more drainage in Central and South Florida, and less irrigation available. So it's not snowbirds, it's not less fertile soil, soils are still as fertile as they were before, it's more drainage. Does the uh, root knot nematode live in the Bahia grass? I don't know the answer. It does. But I mean, if you're going to try to seed this in Bahia or something like that, you just put yourself into a situation. It's not going to affect Bahia grass, but... But with, with the clover or whatever. Yeah. yeah. I mean, are, well, I guess what I'm asking, are there enough to live in it to affect the grass you're trying to plant? They're going to be there. Yeah. Yeah. Gonna be so there. you'll have some. Okay. You'll have some. They won't affect the hay grass as much. No, but it'll affect what you're putting in, like the clover. Yeah. yeah. That's what I'm saying. If you have the average for Florida flatwood soil, you'll have some. It would not mean that those are there. Yeah. And the way to get around it is if, if you do have a real bad stand of root knot nematode and it kills out your white clover, don't plant it yeah. for three or four years. Yeah, let it die off. Let it go away and they come back. But uh, yeah, here's just a chart. Red clover can be grown. Uh, I've seen it grown fairly successful over off of 70. White clover is probably going to do a little bit better. But white clover comes out a little bit better. 80% energy, 25% crude protein. And orchard grass, we can't do that. Tall fescue, we can't do that either. How many people have this? Mm. Now, Brent Sellers isn't here, so I can talk about this. If y'all tell him I said this, I'm, I don't know what y'all are talking about. He'll be here next week. Yeah, that's fine. So y'all just don't tell him I talked about this. Because you're supposed to kill it. You're supposed to kill it. You can tell him I said that. You're supposed to kill it. But this is what's in it. Well... <laughs> If you do it right, the cattle will eat it. Right. If you do, and, and you can help get rid of some of it. You can. And you, know, that, you know, it can be done that way. You got to do it right. And that's what that's what I'm going to talk about. This this all comes from about the same area. You can tell this producer and this producer are the, that's the same producer. Wow. And those are the same. And you can tell this is continuously grazed. And this is rotated. So even the unfertilized bahia is still pretty good at fruit protein. And it beats the fertilized bahia that's continuously grazed and protein. TDN didn't change. If you fertilized it, if you rotated, energy stayed the same at 59. This is what's interesting. Fertilized smunk grass was 14% crude protein. And I guarantee that was not protein. That was probably, I mean, it couldn't be. Because to get that high of protein, it hadn't been grazed continuously. Because cows, like you know, don't eat smoke grass until you mow it. And then about, it takes what, three weeks to put on seed heads, and then you probably have another two weeks before they don't eat it again. Mm -hmm. We can barn and get the same effect out of it. We've right. done it before. Yeah. And then you come back and cattle will mow it off pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting about this is if you can keep that smoke grass mowed, and it might just be you mowing it in the beginning of the season just to get rid of that old dead rank stuff that they're not going to eat from the winter time, they'll keep it moved for you. Me and John witnessed this. We did a study with Brent uh, during the spring into the summer, 
where we were pulling cows in and on uh, different plots. And we'll, we'll talk about this at the smoke grass field day, but the thing I noticed, we were coaxing those cows into the plot. They didn't want to go, so we had a second pellet. We were dropping pellets and they were following us. As soon as they got into those plots with that burned smoke grass that was about that tall and bright green, yep. they quit eating range pellets and went to the smoke grass. So that tells you something. If you can keep that stuff mowed, and if you can keep the vet, once it puts on seed heads, it'll do it about three weeks after you mow it. You probably got about a week. But if you can, if you can get those cows in there to mow it down and keep it mowed, they're going to get a pretty good quality forage in that uh, mowed smut grass. The only thing bad about smut grass, how much tonnage you're going to get out of that plant? Not much. Not not as much as compared to a solid field of bahia, but. Kind of got to work with what we got. We know that killing it is becoming expensive. Is spe expensive. <clears throat> it's hard work. Really, probably the best way to do it is spot spraying Roundup, and that involves you getting in the side by side and riding over God's creation with a sprayer and spraying smoke grass clumps. Velpar, I guess. Yeah, yeah, like I was telling Deanna, Velpar, you can spray Velpar. Cost about anywhere, it depends on which one you get. If you get the generic, it costs you about $35, $38 an acre. If you get the real stuff, Velpar, about $45. You can spray it for $40 an acre. If you don't get any rain, it doesn't work. If you get too much rain, it doesn't work. You have to get the right amount of rain, and that's somewhere in between half inch and three inches. So if you know when you're going to get two inches of rain, run out there and spray Velpar real quick. If you don't know how much rain you're going to get, don't spray Velpar. So more than likely, you're not going to spray bell pole. Another thing you better not do is spray that grass when it's under stress. If it's in a bahia field or something like that, because I've done it before and nuked the bahia field. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm talking about drought stress or water stress. They're the same. If that paints on that stress, it will clean it up. It looked like that brown you had there while ago. Yeah. And smut grass will still be there. <laughs> that's well, that's, that's the other thing. After you spray it with bell you got to come back the next year to spray it with bell pole. Because right. it's going to keep coming back. But... I just wanted to show you all this. Um, that we, we, I didn't have this tested, but the guy that did sent me some pictures of the results. But I had never seen it anywhere, but I wanted to share it that if you manage smut grass correctly, it can be a piece of forage. Now, I'm going to tell you, you want to try to kill it. You want to try to kill it, because I work for UF. You want to try to kill it. But it can be a piece of forage if you manage it right. Anybody have any questions for me? We just bought one of those machines here a few uh, months ago. The wiper, the roller wiper, but mm -hmm. yeah, tried it out with mixed results. We get, it's hard to regulate how much you're putting out. It's hard to regulate it, and those smut grass clumps have a lot of dead leaves and soaking up that roundup. This was alive. really thick. Yeah, if you can burn it. I think say we did about 20 years ago. We did that. These machines make a cycle. About every 20 years they come out. <laughs> Yeah. And we did it about 20 years ago. We burned off a solid field. Mm -hmm. and they'd get about this high. It nailed it, buddy. But yeah. you got to just about wipe it both directions because it lays it over and you don't get it down in the other yeah. side. You miss yeah. it. Because that will go straight down that, that, on that grass and that smut grass will not go around. Mm -hmm. Using Roundup or something like that. Yeah. So, no, yeah. Why, you I, got to yeah. have tender. You got to have one of the plants. So. Yeah. So, yeah, most of the time you got to burn it remote before you go out there and wipe it. Um, 